I love it. Recording yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Brian should be on here. He he confirmed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, because um, I, I'm pretty unclear about like. Uh, I think there's stuff we got to be doing with respect to the, um, as you said, the exemption thing. I feel like, I feel like we're not, um, I guess on the same page in terms of like, okay, exactly what are our goals? Like what kind of timelines there are for it? Uh, how aggressively we pursue it. Um, I mean, regarding, I mean, what, immediately speaking like regarding the exemption so is that something you're actually like actively pursuing right now um or Ta i've taken that... i've taken that process as far as i can until we have a program outline curriculum and some administrative data that i don't have you know we, we you and i need to fill out together basically so the online portal is where all of the education department people handle their stuff and i filled mm -hmm. out as much as i can just based on what i know i could probably dig into the wiki and find some more info but i prefer that i not be the person doing that and so the next step would be drop a program outline as a document submit the exception and then wait for approval which is so a that's... 30 day process Okay, so so we need to meet on that. That that's our next step. So maybe we should be. Was was our meeting like the the weekly meeting? So there's the one on regarding the the builder crash course, but it sounds like we should be meeting on this like anytime or. They're reinforcing. Or was... so in order in order to advance the education pathway, we need to have some program to submit. Right now, the Builder Crash course, we don't have, a, have the curriculum yet. We don't have the things saying, this is what people are going to show up to do, and this is how, what, what they're going to pay, and um, this is what we're, we're providing. All that stuff. But was, this, was the Builder Crash course the thing? Because we also talked about 3D printer or some other things. It, it's, it's whatever you want to focus on first, but I would say that it makes more sense to just focus on one product. Because the first, if the first thing we're going to do is build a crash course, then we need to complete that plan and sell that plan to the Department <laughs> of Education first. Because if you do the 3D printer education approval, it doesn't benefit us if we're not doing that two-week course or week-long course. Okay. Then. And what's... So regarding the... Uh, I'm not clear about the scope of what this education opportunity has to be like. How extensive is it? Is it something that's like a week thing? Is it like, can it be a weekend? Is it a week? Is it like a month thing? Is it like, what exactly is the time duration of the educational the, the, thing that could be any the, at all? They, they approve it by program. So if we're, if we're applying for a non-vocational status, it can be one day. Because you're not you're not saying that you're going to endow somebody with a industry standard certification. You're just saying people are going to pay us to come and learn stuff. But that's maybe maybe we diversify the the package of the here's the builder crash course. So that's two weeks. That's pretty ambitious. But wouldn't there be something before that? More along the lines how we do the three day stem or steam curriculum where you get some critical design learning and and the thing we can definitely come up with that but after the learnings from the apprenticeship i have to revisit exactly what we teach in a short curriculum because um i've been um well my expectations have not been met at all regarding how quickly people can pick up on the collaborative thing it, it uh, either the way to teach it or the content we present to it, something has to be different, but it's not working right now in a way I think it could work. There's a huge promise. That promise, uh, uh, in the general sense, that people become the creators, designers of the world around them. And I think there's, 
there's meaningful, tangible steps that after a short course, people can actually start contributing meaningfully in that process. But maybe like we need to really discuss what that means because like from the programs at OSE, it's like the return on investment in terms of people actually contributing back to it. No, it's, it's, it's not happening. It's not happening along the lines. Like I think you can learn like this very basic thing, small thing. And if you understand the, the concept of, um, and this is like the whole bigger, bigger question that we're trying to solve, like as the overall mission of OSC, like how to save the world here is how do you get to collaborative design? Cause there's a definite, uh, or collaborative, a collaborative society or an open source economy. There's some very, very basic concepts that people to people are like completely foreign. And it's related to all the stuff we're, we're talking about. It's like, okay, uh, call it uh, reinventing the American dream, call it transforming society, uh, whatever kind of uh, labels we can put to. Um, so we can start with maybe like, here's the highest level, most popularly digestible way to do this. Cause right now I've been somewhat in the weeds, like, okay, if you want to design hardware artifacts, this is how you can do it, how you can collaborate with anybody else in the world, build upon existing knowledge and contribute things that actually move real products forward. So that's like super technical. It's like amount of skill required for it, even though like everybody does that. Everybody does that in, in a workforce. You work for some company, you're either selling shit or you're designing stuff or related things. Like a lot of it is uh, related to the physical world and stuff. So it's a, it's a topic that is all around us, but people don't even see it. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that maybe what we can start with as in, the, in terms of the rigorous, like actual certification or education would be like jumping out of the weeds a little bit to a higher level picture of this potential. Cause I feel that if we can communicate that potential more effectively, we can do better. Uh, so I'm just saying, maybe we, we need to have a discussion about uh, jumping out of the weeds a little bit. And maybe if that's the way you can help out. Like you and I, maybe you and I can collaborate on enunciating this bigger vision that becomes communicable to a much larger population to the point that we're actually like starting to build mass, build momentum. Because while people got inspired through all this TED talk and stuff, it's like, man, as far as rubber hitting the road with people actually um, doing something about it, I feel like absolutely failed. Like I have absolutely failed to communicate how you actually do it. So there's the inspiration, there's the TED talk, but it's like, how do you actually do it? Because uh, right now, the answer to me is that it is so complicated to learn that mindset, <laughs> skill set, and so forth. Uh, but maybe we need to revisit that question and start looking at how do you communicate this in a different way? Maybe that's the kind of discussion you and I need to be having, um, which really underlies all the work that we're doing together, right? Like, say we're creating the Builder Crash Course. Uh, yeah. Does this make any sense? I, I think so. I mean... From my perspective, you have done that. So, so a couple data points. Your revenue's increased. You People have shown up willing to work. It hasn't always panned out as you wanted to, but people are showing up. Yeah. There is yeah. an interest. And to me, the bridge we have to cross is you have to play in the space they're comfortable with first. Because a lot of the culture change that we're talking about, in my opinion, is the result of uh, experience and being shown, not told. So like when I go back to that experience I had going to my buddy's ranch in South Dakota, if you had described in words to me and told me that that was real empowerment and ingenuity, that would not have had the same impact as me seeing it with my own eyes and having the the raw experience of that that interpersonal connection and getting my hands dirty on the ranch and so to me it, if i look at this as sort of like a 
a culture change that occurs over a time span of years, you're just in the initial portion in which you're introducing people to possibilities that they yeah. didn't conceive of initially. And so progress means refining what you've already done into the new swarm build that we're working on, demonstrating the all of the benefits from an efficiency and, and um, uh, effectiveness angle. And that's how you build the, that's how you cross the bridge between what's in your brain and people seeing and sort of buying into that vision. And I, I just think that, I think it's hard <laughs> for you to have that perspective because you've been on the ground in the trenches for a decade now. Um, do you have Brian's cell? Do you want to text in to see if he's coming or? Um, yeah, if I can find my phone here. Yeah. If you need, I, I'm concerned. What's your? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. You concerned what? Uh, the calendar automatically adds a Google link, even though I schedule it through Zoom. So. I just want to make sure he's not at the wrong link. And usually I get an email anytime anybody is in the waiting room and I, I haven't seen him show up yet. I know David Leisure couldn't make it tonight. I haven't heard back from Jesse, but Brian confirmed. Yeah, I just texted him. Um, yeah, uh, see if ask him if he's joining us. Um, yeah, and in some way, th stuff is happening. Like uh, this was the worst year. This was the best year. It's like opposites. Yeah, and we're definitely growing, and the foundation is being laid. Yeah, by all means. Um, what you're observing is. I'm getting very like very ambitious and impatient. Um, I am pretty ambitious. Uh, all the stuff I want to try to start to connect, like like for example, doubling revenue every year is a very explicit goal I have. Like for next year, it would be like 400k in terms of impact. Yeah. Um, and keep keeping that momentum going. It's uh, yeah. That's that's just that's just the point. It, it's like um yeah yeah just being ambitious and, and knowing that all this stuff is possible and also inevitable so that's why you know i have decent energy to do it right but yeah that, that's kind of what you're saying but um so what's what's your strength would you say like maybe like let's start that discussion how we can work effectively oh there's brian you want me to let him in and continue this later? <laughs> okay. Hey, Brian. What are you up to? <laughs> Hello? Hey, Brian. Hey. I can't hear anybody. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm on. <clears throat> I hear the crickets. You shouldn't. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. And John, how about John? Yeah, yeah. Test, test. Yeah. Testing, testing. Okay. I hear the crickets. Is that you, Martin? No. I don't crickets. hear any crickets. <laughs> yeah. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm very guitar. I got oh, a window wait. open. I got to figure out what it is. <laughs> Marty, my, my strength is setting up Zoom calls. That's my strength. Oh, what else? Are you a storyteller? I think no, you're right. I mean, look, no. I, 
You, you kind of put me on the spot for a question. I, I don't think I was prepared to answer really. I mean, I, my philosophy is you've been, you've seen some of the work I've done, you know, getting the applications and stuff ready and the conversations we've had, you know, I, I think a better place to start is like, what, what has struck out at you? I could give you my strengths in terms of like my previous work experience in the military, but um you know, with Brian on, I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Did, did you figure the window out, Brian? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, Let's do it. Where, where, where do you want to start? Because it's been a while since we've spoken. And um, did something prompt that email yes. where you, you were looking for an update? Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're, uh, Marchin, I don't know. I haven't talked to you in a while. And I feel like I I yeah. would like to reconnect. But uh, we just applied yeah, just for... Well, just quick, quick, like, because, yeah, we haven't caught up in, in some time. But by my side, I was sick for a little bit of time, like, last week. And then, I, I don't know, Brian, if you saw, but but Jeff quit. So we kind of had to cover a little bit for him. His mom died. He had to, uh, so he had to take care of his father. He left, like, now, about two weeks ago. So pretty busy, like, trying to recover some of the stuff because had to winterize and do other stuff, kind of cover for what he was doing. So, no, it's been pretty quite hectic. Otherwise, the summer X's were kind of like finishing the last month here. So that's where we're at. Well, mm -hmm. well it's like it's a winter X now. <laughs> the winter X. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Well, that's good. I, I am glad that I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I, uh, I, we got you. I knew, I remember you were sick. I was talking to Katarina because I really wanted to feature y'all in our grant and we ended up being able to do that. So thank you. So that's, yeah. I sent out the final thing today so that you have that. Um, but yeah, the prompt was, there's two more big grants coming up. One is around um, good jobs uh, in mm -hmm. February. And I wanted to be able to say that you're a nationally, you know, or a state recognized apprenticeship program or whatever we could. And so I, that's, you know, that was, um, what prompted it cool cool okay so i is it, if it's cool with you march i can just jump in and, and give yeah. you a yeah. run down. okay <clears throat> so since yeah. the last time we spoke we developed a curriculum and filled out the complete application for a missouri state apprenticeship the name of the job title we're applying under is called production technologist it was developed in the late 90s by um, some, some communications company that's no longer existing. I forgot what it was. And it was basically designed for people who are going to work on uh, circuit boards in a factory. And they had to understand like fundamentals of electrical engineering and some other stuff. Um, when, the when the company, you know, was acquired or whatever, the standards for the apprenticeship remained in the Department of Labor's approved list. And so what we did is we said, oh, cool. OSC is already doing all of this stuff plus building homes. And so we developed this work process around that and established a relationship with the state apprenticeship coordinator and the employee who oversees Marchand's region. And so here's where we stand. They like our work process. They're willing to approve it on paper. They know that we're far away from actually having apprentices on the ground for the full two year um, curriculum. And they're still willing to approve the standards that we pro uh, provided. Their only hang up is they need to do a site visit to make sure that Marchin's real and you know, he has the tools and the safety stuff and is com generally compliant with their minimum standards. And they can't do a site visit until they have a budget. They won't have a budget until Congress gives them one. And that's where we stand. The last I heard was they're going to shoot from in November because they had other travel scheduled for that time. The site visit would basically be a day. Uh, it would be the local, uh, the local level department of labor, not the state. 
And <clears throat> I couldn't get a concrete answer from them about what exactly they're looking for because this is the first time they've ever had an organization like OSC. I don't think they know exactly what they're looking for. Um, and, you know, I, to me, it's more about relationship building and, you know, sort of just seeing it for themselves. Um, I think it's possible. Mid November is not that bad. I'm sorry? Mid November site visit isn't so bad. Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard anything from them since I spoke to them. The last I talked to them was October 12th. So, um, you know, it's government. They're going to shut down for Thanksgiving. There would be a two week break over the Christmas holiday, which doesn't leave us a whole lot of time before February. But, you know, really, the to me, the biggest. If we just think about like scenarios, right? The worst possible scenarios they show up and be like, this does not meet anything. We're not willing to put our name on this. Um, here's a list of changes you need to make, right? And then Marching has to decide whether or not it's worth pursuing that or the other project we are currently working on, which is an education pathway, um, which I can also give you an update on separately. The best this possible the pathway? Correct. Yeah, so when you think Department of Labor, think employment, education is, is students, just like it sounds. Two different agencies. Um, the best possible scenario is they show up for the site visit and they say, okay, great. Um, this is a real thing. We're, ten we're, we're approving your standards, but before you bring any apprentices on, you need to call us so that we can go over the, all of the boilerplate legal stuff. Um, and then, Theoretically, once they approve the standards, we can then go through the VA and, and get the GI Bill certification. Um, although that is also, you know, not without risk because the VA is going to look at the Department of Labor's database, and if they've only approved our standards, then it may not be real enough to them yet. Uh, that's a bridge to cross in the future. Um, Sorry, then, sorry. The, there's a. Can you clarify that there's a relationship between the the education route? They might be affected by the outcome of the apprenticeship route. No, no, no. The the um, uh, GI Bill. I'm, I'm talking about the GI Bill. So, so the to become GI Bill certified, the VA is going to look at the Depart Department of Labor's list of approved apprenticeships, mm -hmm. and if if the Department of Labor only approves our standards, but doesn't have an active status listed next to OSE, the VA may hold off on GI Bill approval until we get the active status. And the active status depends on OSE's ability to meet the standards in the application. Wait, but you said they approve the standards, but then we're not meeting the standards? Yeah, yeah. So, so essentially what we've done with the apprenticeship, like you're, you're not ready to bring on two year apprentices and pay them right now, like today. And so, but what we've done is say, we're going to meet this list of requirements before we bring anybody on as an apprentice. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're approving. Uh -huh. That's the, that's the standards. And then yeah. the execution is what we don't have. Yeah. Right. Okay. But, the but, yeah. Apprenticeship standards and then the VA certification. Right. The, the way the VA handles it is if you're a registered apprenticeship through the department of labor, then you automatically qualify as a GI Bill approved employer. Okay. Um, so, so that's that's the update on the on the labor pathway. Sorry, just to just to re, uh, reiterate. So you said the apprenticeship automatically would get us to GI Bill. Yes. Is that what you said, or? Yep. Um. Like, if this person is like a local representative for, and they're waiting on this congressional funding, like, can't we just get them a Uber ride to Maysville? And, <laughs> I mean, I'm just there saying, like, what's the problem? I don't understand. Like, like it. It sounds like a made up thing, almost. Like they they can't get in a car and drive over to the farm. Everything I'm going to tell you is speculation but it's okay. based on my my extensive experience working with the government um 
they're they are going to operate under the constraint of I cannot leave my office unless my supervisor tells me I can. And that includes a travel form with the amount of gallons of gas that I burned and my stipend for travel and scheduled as an official visit as part of. And so I'm not saying it's impossible to have that conversation with Tracy. He was like a really reasonable dude. Uh, I didn't bring it up because I thought it would be a, I, it just never occurred to me that that would be a possibility. So I can ask about that. Right. I just wouldn't get my hopes Is up. he based in Kansas City? I think so. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'll drive him down there. And okay. Back. I mean, okay. We'll, we'll do it next week. I mean, okay. it's just an idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. The other, the other thing I want to put out there is that I've become close with some of the people with the, like, I don't know if you saw that document uh, March in the final proposal, but the first letter of support is from the state of Missouri Economic Development Department. So we've got people in the governor's office kind of like, I'm talking about it. So if we need a, I don't know if I'm talking to the right people or not, or maybe it's just a completely different sort of like body part of the elephant maybe <laughs> but so let me let me see if i understand this you you would like to have some stamp of approval from this part of labor to bolster a grant application uh yeah there's okay. all this arpa money out there american rescue plan act uh okay. we just applied for one that's a hundred million and we want to apply for another one that's you know five yeah, for good jobs, and we can make open source ecology and open source manufacturing like a big part of that. Is is there something specific about a registered apprenticeship um, that we can't like? Can we? Can we? Are there other ways to to pad the application? Because more like in other words, Marchin is also working on a a intermediary course that we could potentially have employment incorporated just wouldn't meet the registered apprenticeship guidelines. So like, are we constraining ourselves only focusing on that or is there something else we can do? Yeah, there's, we could do whatever we want with that. I mean, okay. we could, I, and I, I think that the university of Missouri, Kansas city, if I'm not right, that kind of just didn't do anything after that meeting marching. No, nothing. So no, I introduced him, no. him to the, um, It'd be helpful to have an academic. <coughs> be helpful to have like a institution, like Missouri MCC, Missouri Community College, or UMKC. Um, I know both of them. I mean, that would be my uh, the other route, or we could just call them an in independent thing, okay. and not even. Um, but it just makes it sound official, you know, and then you can yeah, yeah. things like the VA. And yeah. I, I do think that that's a, that's a, that could be our core audience. I mean, yeah, I, veterans, I mean, they've got the right vibe for, I think what Marchin is doing. Well, we were just talking about how this could, this, this could be sold as a waypoint from veterans leaving the military to re-enter Missouri. The Missouri economy, right? Um, and there are there are transition assistance. There's transition assistance infrastructure in every state that reports to the VA, and there may there may be some way to figure out how to get their stamp of credibility, even if it's not a fully registered apprenticeship as well. So so I can I can investigate that as well. Um, let, should I give you the education update as well? Yeah, sure. So we ha we've taken the application as far as we can. Um, right now, what we have to do is develop a specific program for the first course, which is going to be tentatively a two-week swarm build of a CD go home. And once oh, we build have more like build or crash course, build or crash course. Excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once we have a curriculum outline and a plan. A, a general generalized plan for that 
We submit that as an independent program under the OSC title, organizational umbrella. And then we apply for exemption under non-vocational status. And then under with those two things, we would be approved, OSC would be approved as a proprietary school in the state of Missouri. Uh, the turnaround from when we drop the application to their decision is usually about 30 days. Um, and you know the, the curriculum is something that Marsha and I are just getting started on now. Wow. So a non-vocational, what does that mean really in like, in like, because you don't ever hear like, I'm a non-vocational school. Yeah. Like, it, it means that Martian is not endowing the students with an industry recognized credential. So if he wanted to teach people welding, he would have to meet the same standards as every other welding school in Missouri. Non-vocational status means he can teach basket weaving. And all that does for the Department of Education is it signals that he's not putting people back into the economy that have the same title or credential that other people have that didn't meet the standard or who don't meet the same standard. Um, it's not a guaranteed exemption, but you know, given the depth of the curriculum that we're gonna develop, I don't think it'll be, be a stretch. What does it allow you to do if you have that? So really does two things. The first is it starts the clock for, for OSC to eventually become a GI Bill approved educational facility. The VA requires two years of operation or a like waiver from some, I, I forgot who, but somebody high up in the Department of Education to say like they don't need to exist for two years. They've proven themselves enough. Um, so the, the earlier we can get approved, the better. Uh, from the standpoint of starting that clock. And then the second thing it does is it just adds credibility. Okay. Regarding this Should waiver, like, do, do you know much more about this? Like, I mean, I, I've seen it, I forwarded it to you. I'm sure you didn't have time to read it. Um, but it's, it's like a three page document saying, check the box for the waiver you're applying for. Or, oh, oh sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing it with the exemption. For the, wa the waiver you need, so you don't have to do the two years. No, waiver, yeah that we have no i was thinking more like the waiver allows us to say we are running education like say the education that we're doing right now right yeah 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 that would be an example and the waiver that says okay we're actually getting waived in as that that qual qualifies as being this uh education like non-vocation or education yeah, 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 of yeah. some yeah. sort exemption exemption that, that's the exemption the waiver is something else I mean, yeah, it's just a bunch Exemption. of- Exemption, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, look, I, I should probably be like as tra transparent as possible. Like I'm doing this virtually from Maryland. And so I can imagine that if I knew the right people in the Missouri government, this could be like three days of handshakes and rubber stamp. So like, I, I don't want to constrain the process by what I'm limited to, mm -hmm. but this is, this is the view that I have yeah through all just cold calling agencies basically do you want to try like me sending me forwarding on like the state of where we're at to let's say economic development and just seeing what they'd be willing to help us out with yeah but yeah i think so i mean the, the, from my perspective for the Department of Labor and Department of Education, the holdup, the, the, the sand in the gears right now is OSC is such a ambitious, unconventional organization. And they're used to handling applications from 
beautician schools and phlebotomy schools and you know welding courses and so when when i show up to the department of labor and i say check out their wikipedia page and here are all the links to the 3d printers that they're going to build it's it like does not compute and so that's that's the thing i'm trying to to distill into bite-sized chunks for them so they can say like yes box checks move this application forward okay the the thing i would go back to go ahead oh just that i think that you're you're definitely making progress man so you know it's just only a matter of time really yeah what's to be said about once again here's a standard thing like welding and going through the motions on that, which we still could do, and provide meaningful skills, and, and that's within our what we do already, right? So why not set up a standard, well-recognized thing that's that's low-hanging fruit because it's well-defined and we can pretty much can and clone it, set up the capacity here, and therefore we start the clock. I think the strategy here is to start the clock for the GI Bill acceptance, right? So why, why not do something like that? You know, my only hesitation with that is the fastest route involves getting somebody with the right credentials and, you know, experience teaching welding to actually uh, vet the standards that we submit to the Department of Education. Um, and for you, for you to spend, yeah. do the legwork to make sure you have the like equipment and procedures and manpower and all this other stuff. Sure. I mean, the, one of the limiting factors to a lot of this stuff is who is physically on site able to actually execute. And, you know, that may be something worth looking into, but that historically has been why I haven't considered that an option. Sorry, what's it, the reason why you haven't considered the option? Because... Well, you, you're capacity. limited in what you can execute with manpower on the ground. And it seemed like two birds with one stone to build out the thing that produces both revenue and progresses towards the apprenticeship and can achieve the lowest possible benchmark for the education thing. I mean, is it true that the comparable welding programs are two years long only on welding? I, I, there's several months. They're definitely longer than the, um, the crash build course that we're looking at. But it might be worthwhile to look at the, under the hood of that, what exactly is required yeah. and do we meet that? Cause I mean, for example, you know, all the three months, it's like, we're, we're out there teaching welding or doing it. Uh, so it's like, I'm wondering how much of a cry is it to actually meet the requirements while we're doing what we're doing already. Sure. Because for example, it's like, okay, you need a hundred hours of practice. Well, you better believe we're gonna get a bunch of practice here because we do. Um, people do it all day <laughs> when we right. do the tractor build. So I'm just curious if there's some something we're missing there that's actually readily executable. It, um, it, it definitely might be. I mean, I, one of the first things I did was build the database of trade skills uh, when we were first playing around with curriculum development. Yes. And so there is a welding curriculum in there from Canada, which has like much higher standards. But it was, if I recall, it was it was like a year long. Uh, but no, I mean, yeah, we should we should look at you know other welding schools in Missouri, preferably ones that are close by, and see. How, if you could meet their their standard, and another thing too is like a lot of the, a lot of the standards may be proprietary, or a lot proprietary, of proprietary, not in proprietary institution, but proprietary, proprietary as not open. <clears throat> well, it may be open, but that would recall require some sort of conversation because I did a lot of open source investigation into these trade schools, and they don't publish their, except in Canada, because apparently everything up there oh. is better. <laughs> they don't publish the the full curriculum on their website and so i mean you know it wouldn't be hard right you just go find a recent graduate and be like hey can i see your workbook um well but maybe we turn that into that game which is we're open sourcing critical infrastructures of society part of that is educational infrastructures that kind of stuff we do for a living so maybe that's um 
And now once we, part of the block may be the fact that we don't have the access to all this because this is all hidden. Um, all this information is occult. <laughs> I, I don't want to oversell it. I, like I, we, we should investigate, you know, yeah, it may be out there. I'm sure the community college probably has something, some welding one. That's what I was saying is I know that they have their own apprenticeship probably, but then you'd have to fit into their apprenticeship and then that apprenticeship would have to fit into the department of labor. And then the department, you know, it's just adding another layer. The, the Anything that claims to be a registered apprenticeship through the Department of Labor, it has to be at least a year long. So just consider that as a benchmark. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I well, I, I, it's pretty promising to get this guide, you know, get this <laughs> guide, you know, to Maysville and be yeah. like, hey, you know, we're, we're not... And I'd be happy to help, you know. I, I sent him an email today. So, uh, you know, let me see if he responds and I'll bring, I'll definitely bring it up. Okay. Um, and next time I, if there's something I could forward on to the DED folks, then I could ping them about maybe they know people and I guess the VED? DED is Department of Economic Development. And they're yeah, all but, about jobs and training, you know, like they're into this same discussion. So tell me more yeah, what kind of discussion they would listen to. Yeah. I'm talking to them about, um, I mean, particularly about, you know, I, I, I've been talking to them several times and they're, we're, they wrote a letter of support around a grant related to, and then that o OC is, OSC is in. So it's not like a far reach to be like, hey, we're trying to get this registered. Do you have any? But what, I mean, what pool or like what, um, what can they provide that's, that's in the pathway for getting that? Relationship? Uh, that, that it would just be more like the relationship. It, it would help. It would help Deborah, who's the state coordinator for Missouri for the Department of Labor, to hear from the Department of Economic Development that they are also tracking ONC as this great opportunity. So that you know that top-down or lateral conversation would definitely help us out. But you know, the, another core challenge here is the road to execution is going to require margin of build capacity. And so like, it's, to me, I'm hearing chicken or the egg. Like we're, we're gonna have to get some grant money to put all these big plans into action um, in terms of like hiring the instructors and sourcing the material or whatever. Um, and so it, am, I on the, am I understanding correctly that they don't need us to be operating at full capacity to, to be awarded grant money. They just need to know that we have a plan. That's how I'm writing my grants. <laughs> it's like fake it until you make it. I love it. Yeah, great. I mean, I mean in that it, case, Marchin has more of a track record than probably a lot of the other applicants. Yeah, and so the next, yeah. So, but you know, if, if I were able to say that it's a registered apprenticeship sure. with the Department of Labor, it's, it's helpful, that's all. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, all right. So, I think that guy coming mid November is, I mean, that's, that sounds great. Let's just, I think that, that to me seems the closest. Um, great work. I know you put a lot of time into it and a lot of new ones. Yeah. We were just talking about my, my yeah. ability to contribute, trying to figure that out. So I'm glad to hear it's, it's producing something. We're, we're not there yet, but. But it takes time. These things take time. Right. Tell, is it Brent? What's that? What's the guy's name in Kansas City? Oh, Tracy. Tracy? Tell Tracy I'll, is it him or her? Him. 
Okay. Uh, I'll get him coffee. We'll drive down to Maysville and we'll be, I'll have him back by <laughs> yeah, yeah. by 5 p.m. and uh, we'll uh, we'll show him we'll show him open source ecology and they'll be he'll be a part of the future. Okay. Well, would it help, Brian? And are you willing to Brian just meet with him? Just just say no. Just oh yeah, uh, no, just, I can meet with him. Okay. And we're you can um we're we're doing really cool stuff around the city so i could you know i don't know if if he needs convincing just send him some of the links on my signature and be like okay. hey you, got, you should talk right he's writing a big grant around good jobs or something okay you know cool. build back better stuff um there's a lot happening around uh, like in my footprint in the Blue River Valley, where we've been working with the EDC, the Economic Development Corporation of Kansas City, and the IDA, the people who did the bonds for the new airport, around how to create, how to revive this industrial area that sort of, it used to be where Ford's Motor Company had its second factory, um, GM, Bendix, um, a lot of them kind of boomed and busted. And there's a huge black and brown, you know, neighborhoods, eight neighborhoods that are used to be employed there. And the river itself was like this pristine, affordable, nature loving destination. And so we're, we're basically regenerating that area. And there's a lot of things happening. There's a new port going in that's like gonna make Kansas City like a major marine transport uh, logistics center. There's going to be um, all kinds of green infrastructure jobs, um, regenerative agriculture. Our, our main things that we, we wrote in the last grant was financial innovation, open source manufacturing, regenerative agriculture, and circular economy. So that's, that's, that's my playlist right there. Yeah. And they all are mutual reinforcing. It's not like they're separate. And it's like, right. if I can get regenerative agriculture going, then I can use that alongside financial innovation to register carbon credits and, you know, do conservation easements, you know, and, and see the, the population. I think with, with Marchin, what my goal is, I think the education side of his business is really strong. I think that's like, I'm pretty sure that he'll become an apprenticeship of the Department of Labor. It may, I think it'll happen sooner, but if it, if it doesn't happen like this year, it'll happen. Uh, the education side will grow, but I'm really interested in the products themselves. We need product managers for every single product. We need to create the right lighting and the right photos, and we need to get a e-commerce site and we got to sell enough of these items to make sure that the people going through these trainings have clients and right. ultimately we could come up with a structure around a factory if we're selling enough of these things and we have to make a factory and then we can do the first factory in kansas city that would be amazing yes i mean the first factory here will build the production facility for the CD homes and that could be transplanted or replicated like you can think of what we build here is the prototype maybe do it in Kansas City but when I see it like okay say we're going to be solving housing in Kansas City well you got to put in that micro factory in the local community and employ the local people <clears throat> absolutely yeah. so that would be just the, the first decentralized you know open source factory and we'd have to like really be smart about how we approach it and what our outcomes are. And, but you have to have customers. That's the thing is that these products need to be, you know, you need the product pages and all the benefits and you got to sell it just like any other house, you know, any other tractor, it's got to have all those um, features and videos and photos and that website. And I think, that's a whole nother, that's why 
we called every single one of those categories a micro cluster because inside open source manufacturing, there's like a whole ecosystem of businesses that need to come to life. And entrepreneurship is really, I think that we're training people to be entrepreneurs more than apprentices. I mean, there's, there's some blend there because as you say, the non-vocational status, I mean, we're, we need entrepreneurs. We don't need employees. I, that's my opinion. Uh, for this particular work, we need every single one of the things I, I just mentioned, we need an entrepreneur to lead and go, you know? And, and they're out there. I mean, I don't know if Martin's told you, but we, we've already, I've already had a, a veteran of started a relationship who is just waiting to graduate college so that he can move out to Missouri and work on site. Um, and he's got an incredible story too. I mean, like he started his own nonprofit. It was basically pimp my ride, but for um, victims of bullying. So he would like take local kids in their bands and like renovate them for him. He was featured on Ellen, Ellen's show. I don't know. Like the, the point is that this is becoming a buzz light for some pretty incredible people who are just right below the surface. That's cool, man. But I could see us having trouble fitting into the apprentice if we're want, you know, wanting entrepreneurs. And I'm even teaching entrepreneurship at UMKC and I'm just like, this is not the right type of person. It, yeah, very, I mean, I, I see what I'm doing with the Department of Labor somewhat subversive because I'm using their terminology and language kind of against them. Like they, they're, they're asking us to fit into this box of apprentice where you become yeah. an electrician, you're a certified electrician, that's all you do, here's your certificate. And <clears throat> what we're saying is like, yeah, we meet all those criteria plus a bunch of other stuff. So just look at this, you know, all the boxes that we check for you so you can improve us and move on. All the, everything else that is a part of March's Visions is, is extra and it's being smuggled in through this very bureaucratic process. And I'm okay Smug. with that Yeah. because, <laughs> yeah. Because like, they, in, in my opinion, like the success stories is how they're gonna change. They, they will have to adapt to us once they see the potential here. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I feel like, I, I, I totally support that. Okay, so uh, Tracy, you know, happy to meet for coffee or okay. take, and take her or him down. Um, I think you're making progress. Um, cool. I'll, if there's somewhere, if there's something I can do with the DED, just let me know. Uh, you know, if there's something I could like just forward on, be like, hey, here's where we're at. Um, yeah. But I think that I, I wouldn't expect it to happen, you know, overnight. I think that. Yeah, from what we've talked about last, this is progress. So, I'm just taking notes. So I got my to-do list. Um, just write down, smuggle them in, because pimping ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Trojan horse. It. Yeah. Or exception. It's, I, I like Inception. Inception is good. Mind virus. Yeah. I I I had a, the EDC did a presentation, I think on Tuesday, and they had the four things I said, and it said financial innovation, circular economy, open source manufacturing on their <laughs> big screen in front of all these like city people. And I was like, yes. Was that through you or they had it independently? Through me. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. like, um, they, he didn't actually say it. I was like, I wonder if he actually knows what it is. Like, or if he's just, <laughs> cause he, he only said circular economy. I was like, I wonder if he's like, he knows what I'm having him say. That's awesome. <clears throat> cool. 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 Hopefully we'll, um, oh, maybe we could have another session uh, when we're putting together this good jobs grant. 
Um, we could just, I could kind of, okay, here's what I'm thinking. You know, maybe y'all could give me feedback or something. That'll be helpful for me too because I've never written a grant, so it, it'll be informative. Yeah, it's like, um, I mean, the way we wrote this last one was like a lot of there's a lot of theory around this climate, civilian climate core. I don't know if you've read about it. Yeah, uh, if it's the same organization. I'm thinking of uh, it was an option for like a summer internship in grad school where like you get paired with a company in their sustainability department. It actually doesn't exist yet. It's it's just okay, this no. idea of like the uh, FDR era workforce development program that could we could use for climate. And so, you know, like building the roads and all the things like just paying right. people, you know, during the depression and um, so, you know, we wrote that into our plan. Let's actually put it into reality. Let's do that. Right. <clears throat> Have people work on green infrastructure, regenerative ag, sort of wetland and water, you know, quality restoration stuff. And then they could graduate into, if they can do that stuff, then they, you know, they could graduate into more, you know, these deeper frontier areas like right. open source manufacturing or, but I learned about a new model today in South Africa. And I mean, we might be able to just pay people. I mean, with all this money, we might be able to just create our own financing structure and, and finance people through our program with this grant. Oh, man. <clears throat> so, oh, you're saying with this grant or, or uh, I was saying just even independently of that, uh, of financial innovation and investment structure for it. So I started talking about a four-year college level type of program, which is now I think, okay, if I want to capture what I know about uh, how to design and build anything, how to collaborate and how to change the world, you need a little bit of training, but then how do you fund people going through that kind of program? In the long term, it might be GI Bill stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But now in the meantime, how do you do it right now? I would say financial innovation could be one way where if we're actually promising these are products that get developed, invest in it. You know, so how do you structure the incentives and something like a DAO um, yeah. that people are able to uh, pay into? That's that's financial innovation. That's, that's like really understanding incentive structures. And um, yeah. I mean, yeah. especially because the GI Bill is not a panacea. But all the GI Bill gives us is a predictable path for the person who has no income once they enter the military. That's the problem that that solves. But it's it's not going to meet all the the financing needs for a longer program. Um, and in the labor one, you pay you we have to pay, and in the education one, they pay us. Exactly. John, tell me more. To what level can this provide revenue or students? Because when I think students, students are people who are learning and applied in applied learning. They're actually contributing also work to to actual open collaborative development. What yeah. do you see as the limits to that or opportunities and limits? So, so in order for the GI Bill to exist as a part of the program, it has to be a supplement to the wages they're getting from you. On the, on the employment side. Contra, the, the opposite education pathway is GI Bill is what's funding their education. And there's a cap. So for employment, depending on how you structure your wages, it's about $22,000 of payroll per apprentice on top of what they're earning as, as from you, from their wages. On the education side, I forgot what the, the cat it's probably like 26,000, something like that for tuition per year. With labor, you spend uh, 26. For, for labor, you have to structure your wages around uh, you. So in other words, you set what you consider a journeyman's wage. Journeyman is just a fully 
qualified apprentice, somebody who's completed the whole program. So if you would pay a fully qualified apprentice 30 bucks, day one, they have to earn at least $15 an hour. So you're not allowed to pay them less than 50% of what you would pay a fully qualified person, worker. So that's, day, that's, that's your starting wage. Your ending wage is the, considered the journeyman's apprentice. And then there just has to be some increase periodically between day one when they graduate. And what the GI Bill does is it says, if you pay them 50% of the fully qualified wage on day one, the GI Bill is gonna cover roughly the remainder um, through something called a housing allowance that is specific to the zip code. And in Maysville, it's like 12 or $1,300 a month on top of the wages that they make. Kansas City, it'll be higher because it's based on cost of living. But on average, and I've done this in Texas, uh, South Carolina, Virginia, some other states, it comes out to about $20,000 cash after taxes to the veteran apprentice per year. And, and so just to make sure I understand, the, your OSC pays the apprentice in the labor category, but in the education one, GI Bill pays the tuition the education model. Tuition. Yeah. Yeah. So in education, the VA pays OSC directly and they also pay the student uh, the same monthly housing allowance uh, of twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a year. Uh, or a month. This. Excuse me. What is there any sort of business vocational that we could fall into? Like could we do something with entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship or uh business vocational you mean like um on the education side yeah like vocational training yeah yeah i mean i if, if you, the limiting factor is going to be whether or not the department of education reads through the curriculum and says like yep that meets our standards for entrepreneurship credentialing whatever that is on the and 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 that is way up in the air. I have no idea, you know, especially, especially for proprietary schools to be teaching entrepreneurship, that's gonna draw a lot of attention because it's, <laughs> it's not phlebotomy. It's not, you know, right. it's not a very specific, clearly defined task. Or innovation? Sure, same thing. I mean, I, I think anything is possible, um, but curriculum development and or developing the program and packaging it as part of the application itself is going to be require manpower and marching brain and limited resources. And so I think we have to be strategic about where we focus our attention. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall. It's great. No, 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 no. It's, it's awesome. I mean, Yeah, I think that Marchin, regardless of the GI Bill, we should come up with a financial mechanism to offer scholarships or financing to anybody who wants to go through a OSC training program. What would you what would be the first thing that comes to your mind as far as a solution for that? Well, the easiest would be to get grant money so that it's the most flexible. Um and even a revolving loan fund, which is what I, okay, so if we get this grant, there's two phases. The first phase is by December, we'll find out if we got 500,000 in phase two, it's already like early next year where we have to reapply. And that goes, it jumps all the way from 500,000 to 25 to hundred million. So you really, you had to think through how would you spend hundred million? Um, and in that situation, I gave each one of the micro clusters uh, access to it, financial instruments. One was micro grants. The second was a revolving loan fund. Third was like market demand um, purchase agreement, pre purchase agreements. And the fourth is um, something I can't remember. But so to me, I think that. Um, I mean, there's got to be a, I could create a whole list of financial instruments that we could think about. 
I mean, there's peer to peer, there's just pure philanthropy, there's getting a few, I mean, how would you, I imagine if we got UMKC then, or like a university or MCC, the advantage of them is financial aid. And like, then you access like, I don't know the exact term, but there's certain college loans. Like you get a college loan for a stupid business degree that doesn't help you in 2021, or do you get a college loan to go to OSC? I would take it to go to OSC, but we would have to also invest in your infrastructure. So uh, you would have to, and so I also wouldn't rule out what you said earlier about DAOs and I just think it's a little harder and, you know, but who knows, maybe there's a lot of crypto whales that, that you know, or that we could talk to, I mean, that would be into this kind of thing. I mean, maybe somebody will just say, hey, send me your wallet <laughs> and we will. <laughs> I, I do think that we should think about financial innovation and how to, how, how to finance every single person that wants to learn and is willing to come to, yeah. to Missouri to study this. We should either be able to scholarship them in or um, have a work exchange. Um, or, you know, have loans, you know, where it's like an actual debt, but General Assembly did something around that. I don't know if you remember General Assembly. You know who that is? It, the, the loan route is, before we met today, I was thinking of Kiva.org. I was just going to apply for a zero interest fifteen thousand dollar loan to cover like two weeks of wages for a couple veterans to show up and you know participate. Um, and that was under the assumption that you would sell the house or three D printer or whatever as the thing to pay back the loan. Um, but that's small scale. That's small potatoes compared to what you're talking about. But the principle is the same. Like if you build the program. Martian already has a track record. It's just a matter of, of selling it to some funders or unique, you know, through unique financial instruments. I mean, I, I'll get, I, I, I will, I, I should have spent some time on this already, but um, I can't That's interesting, like the Kiva loan that, that actually pays for labor where the product that comes out the other side, if we can guarantee it is a house, 15K would be a, about the right, right figure. And out of that, you get 50K. Something to think about. <clears throat> no, this is all going to come out in a wash once we get the, what we're waiting for right now is the exact numbers that show $250 an hour, radical efficiency. That's that's what I want to prove. I want to show that 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 I can do that. It'll require me doing that myself before I can teach others to do that. But that's what it's gonna. That's that's the stated goal right now. Doing what yourself? Building the house, <clears throat> the techniques for how you do it so efficiently, effectively that revenue is when your time is considered, it's two hundred fifty bucks per hour. Yeah. Okay. I, I see General Assembly. Yeah. The, this GI Bill thing. So, so what what they did is they got certified as an educational institution, and then mm -hmm. got the VA to sign off on the GI Bill. And and I don't know anything about General Assembly, the company, but um, is all they do teach coding, or yeah, it looks like it, or it's like an instruction or a school. It's an educational facility. Uh, oh, John, repeat that. How did General Assembly do it? They they got VA to sign off on their program. How? No, they they went the education pathway. Mm -hmm. Here's the. So uh, did, yeah. 
I just found their loan, their financing handbook. That's what, that's what really what I was looking for was they do some really interesting like income share agreements. So they do, um, I mean, that, that's a question for Marchin is like, I would just ask you like, this is how they find, they're, they're, they're a comparable school. Mm. This is their financing mm -hmm. handbook. Out of these mm -hmm. financing you know, options, which one would you be open to? I'll send a link to the financial handbook, financing handbook. Yeah, it's in the chat. So the yeah, the employer sponsorship. Um, oh, they're 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 doing partners through Climb and Meritize, and it's hmm. some are zero percent, some of them are five to fifteen percent, three to ten years for their partner loans, and then they have this thing called um, the climb credit. Not sure how they How do I do 24 months zero interest? Looks like Klein is just, it's similar to Kiva.org. Mm. And Kiva is crowd? No, I, I think it's, they match you to specific donors or pools of donors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something to keep, keep in mind, um, definitely. What about income share agreements? They say repayment um, begins only once you secure a role earning at least 40K. Pay back 10% of your monthly income over 48 months. Payments are maxed out at 1.5 times. Yeah. But then, sounds, you know, you're taking all the risks. Well, if it's, you it's, don't have people earning income on the other side of your program, then you're, right. you're not going to get anything. Well, so it's not just that, but it, it may also be unnecessary if they're going to sell a product that's going to create revenue as well. You could do it on a monthly basis. You know, you could, we could create a little um, matrix, you know, for income sharing. You and know? John, you said for income sharing in one way where we are not hiring them, but but they're getting out into entrepreneurship. Is that what you were suggesting? No, I was just, I was just saying that we're, in the short term, we're talking about two week, you know, uh, extreme build events, right? And so, like, the revenue is going to come from the product that you sell at the end of that. Well, there's two things. One is the builder crash course. The other could be is where we actually get a client to build for. Two different things. Yeah. Or you build for, Are you, yeah, you sell what you build. Build a potential build. client. Right. And you're building yeah. the house. In rare situations where the codes don't get in the way with inspection schedules, that's a challenge to solve. Two challenges are people showing up. Two, codes uh, inspection schedule allows you to do it in two weeks. Because we can build in two weeks, but we, we may not be able to get inspected and build in, the, in two weeks. Right. But you could have a house essentially that you could set up somewhere. You wouldn't even have Oh to yeah, you could build the kit that yeah, you yeah, could the kit. manufacture a that, kit. And that's what I hope like our this oh, this is good yeah. that we're on the phone because we introduced the concept of a micro cluster. Like if we had let's say a mil this million dollar budget, right, for open source manufacturing, we would go pay a firm to build you an e-commerce site and just take all the pictures and it would be like kits, you know, get your kit and it would be a fancy little name and everything would be really nicely designed and you would get inbound sales. 
And anyways, I've been saying this since I met you. <laughs> I know, that but what's that? Decide. Yeah, well, how do we do it? Like, what's the, yeah, this execution on that would be. Uh... I'm trying to get the money. I think because we can do that right now for the printer, uh, for the tractor, for the house. I mean, we yeah, to get assistance on it, but it requires pretty decent. Um, if there's product development, like right now, the last mile of the house is some product development. I think it would be easiest for the 3D printer or say brick press, which are already developed to product state. Yeah. So yeah, but you have to be careful yeah be careful exactly whether your product ready enough and if if you need to do some product development then a budget for that which would require qualified people to do that because of the way we design we don't just design any trash we have a lot of a lot of different properties that go into it which which is very challenging for a lot of people because we're designing a whole ecology into the ecology of properties into what we do like for example we can't just hire an architect or some designer to design the house for us we find me one that can do uh, all the properties that we need in a system so it's that there's a challenge there but yes uh, in general this is all all game there yeah well it'll happen it but it's an ecosystem you know like the more yeah. Somehow we have to create a pool function for a bunch of businesses to get started. And the only way that I could think about it in the position, I mean, we could scrape, we could scrape together an e-commerce site and just, I mean, we could do that in the next few months, but I just feel like it needs, you know, like it needs $200,000 plus we should be recording everything that you're doing for instructional videos. Um, and I'm putting that in the budgets. So I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah. I, I've got a media crew standing by for a, a promo video once we have the money also. I'm not saying we have to go with them or whatever, but they did my video and I they do really good work. So really, because uh, I could use some, I could use some video support. Yeah. Um, we're going to get some recordings of Bob, you know, cause he's in his eighties and we need to do that. Um, this, this is from foundation for regeneration. Yeah. Is this Bob Bergabiel? Yeah. So yeah. by the way, Martin, we had 20 institutions write letters of support. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he must have been really sick I felt bad I kept on like emailing Katerina I was like <laughs> you better get his ass <laughs> up out of bed like, you have to do something I yeah. felt so yeah. bad I was like man he was so sick it must have been so sick um, I, I really think that you're doing great work John so don't feel discouraged um, thanks man um, and, uh, you know, the right person will get us through and stamp it. And, you know, hearing about the, the two programs, it seems like the department of education is much more, uh, amenable to our, this, the current stage we're at, you know, for sure. I, I mean, on that note, I don't know if I'm thinking about this correctly, but it's probably good to get your opinion. Talking with Marchin, my my strategy here has been the next, like, find the next MVP. The next MVP for Marchin is the thing that he can generate revenue, do a project he's already familiar with, and get some number of people to show up in person again, so that we can market it and repackage it and iterate until we build up to a two, four year program. Um, and I'm getting the sense from you that building stuff on paper is actually really valuable. And if we build it, we potentially much more money could come and accelerate this process. Do I need to change? Do you think I, do you think I should change the approach that I'm sort of 
guiding marching along on here or because like the next project we have is developing the curriculum for the next two week MVP that we're going to produce. Um, and what is it, what is it that you think I'm saying that's making you think differently? Well, if we had, if we had multiple curriculums for more things that Marchin has product ready to put in front of grant boards or, or who, sources of funding, is it more important to tell a compelling story on paper than it is for Martian to have a feasible MVP by April 1? Um, or maybe that's a false distinction. You know, I'll sleep on that, but the knee jerk yeah, response is MV MVP. Yeah. Cash solves all problems. MVP is cash. Okay. Well, here's the thing is you, you're you basically responding to, let's call it an RFP, which is the, the unique type of system of the apprenticeship. And you've done analysis of the vocational, non-vocational business and, um, you know, the, the welding. And you said, here's the way that we're going to go. I'm doing that for grants. And if, you know, if, if I see an opportunity to write a grant that, you know, it's not gonna, mine's gonna look a lot different, I think. Um, and I haven't gotten into the new one deep enough to, to be able to really give you direction. And I just think there's so many ways that this thing is gonna, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think the financial element that we just talked about, like if you could put an income share agreement, I mean, you're already doing an income share agreement with Ken, right? Yeah, we don't have any so, sales yet, bro. <laughs> yeah, have a program. Well, that's the thing is it's, it's, you make it incredible. I, I say this with all the love in my heart. It's really hard to buy stuff from you on the open source ecology website. It's not designed for purchasing products. It's designed for education. We need this other sister organization that's going to sell this stuff. Like, um, and if we wanted to get on the phone with a bunch of e-commerce people, we could do that. I, I feel like that's the other route you know there's grants there's you know money for education and financing and loans but the other whole business that we haven't really started yet is really selling these products like you're selling them because people find you and it's cool and it's kind of like but th this is a as you say a billion dollar industry and we're um I think that we need at least 200K to like do it right to really get out there. So um, it, it may, may, let, let me just rephrase the, I, I'm operating under the assumption that this whole thing is gonna be bootstrapped. And so all of the plans and things I'm helping marching out with are to get him from today to the next step to get something in the bank. I just wanna make sure that that's still a valuable process and that I shouldn't be focusing more on bigger fish. Um, what would be the bigger fish? Oh, like like the the pitch for grant money, or you you know. I mean, I think we're all bootstrapping until we're not. You know, like okay. one day okay. we'll just, we could have a million dollars in the bank account and do be doing the same thing. It just it's just that you know, the hustle and the, it'll make the difference. So I think um, we should do, I think we should do it all and just um, hopefully that's not, I think that we're dividing and it up and, but if you want to do grants, like if you find a grant and you want to do it, I will help you and we can lean in and do a sprint on it. 
I mean, we hired a grant writer. Um, so, you know, she, she wants me to get an MOU with OSE and I have that drafted and my legal, my fiscal sponsor's been holding it up. So she, I, I did that, I did that um, MOU like, feels like a year ago, six months ago almost. <laughs> and I still haven't, but it's okay. I mean, we're already collaborating in a deep way and it doesn't make any sense. Like they're all like, we're worried about your IP. I'm like, it's open source. Like <laughs> it's, uh, it's all open source, you know? So I think, um, do you have grants that you found that you think that we would be eligible for? No, nah, man. I mean, I just, I just want to make sure that what I'm doing is, is still valuable and not holding things back. Cause I'm, pretty focused on all. the operational plan in the next six to 18 weeks right that's all are you doing like i mean i think i think it's valuable i think that if there's a particular rfp or a grant that we find we can adapt it to do more of what we want to do and less what we have to do to fit into someone else's box. Right. That's, right. that's the value add of the grant money is that if it's the right partner, you know, they're just going to understand that what we're doing is valuable and it won't. Right. Now the financing side is really interesting. I mean, that we could do a little, we could do another work session on that and You know, well, well, the documents you sent from General General Assembly are a validation that you can offer a menu to the people who show up, like different options. And they're just going to tell you out. exactly, right? And I know the founder of General Assembly. I mean, he might be willing to to connect us to his finance people, the climb and the other one. And I know a few other institutions. I guess I just. I mean, ideally we would have, a, we, would, we would almost, we'd be like an agile, we'd get all the benefits, but we'd still be able to be lean and agile, you know? Like, I know this is being recording, but as much as I love UMKC, you know, or MCC, I could see like a lot of advantages and disadvantages of going under their umbrella. But a former colleague of mine helped certify universities for their accreditation and i just i know this is crazy but like you know marchin is a phd and his wife so couldn't we what do we have to do to in order to accept financial aid and he, he, here here it's all about risk ultimately and the reason why i bring up the products is if i if we had a whole company and a team that were selling these products and we could say we sold, we fully employed, or we had our, let's say our, our independent contractors because we're unjobbing. So everybody's their own boss, but we've organizing in ways where we've swarmed and we've built. Hey, did you get that from me or is that your language? I got that from you. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Um. Hold on a second, though. But also recognize that, yes, products, but like I think Jonathan, John's work, super relevant on a crash course, because that is the product that relates directly to the house, which we think is our main product right now as the big cash car. Because otherwise you're saying we're going to diversify into or like do multiple products at a time. But it's like we said, okay, one product, this is it. This is a big one. It's a very important number one cost in people's lives. So I think that... Um, what you're saying, maybe like in terms of rollout and sequencing, that all that productization work, website, marketing site, that falls out directly from the crash course to house, I believe. It falls like, out. Sorry. Falls out. It comes. It's a direct direct product of it. Yeah. So we're we're actually doing what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, I see it as like there's the education business, which is a nonprofit. 
And then there's like the, there's the product ecosystem and business. And like, I, I feel like what you've proven is like, people are willing to fly from around the world to come learn this stuff and they're willing to pay you and they have no real support. We can add in some layers of support through financing structures. We can add in some layer of support through, and, and really let's just call the Department of Labor and Education as another financing structure. It's ultimately what it is. Um, but in order for us to really prove our model, we have to sell the products because yeah, yeah. training people to make this stuff. And if we, if it's not selling, then we're training people for something that, you know, um, yeah, the rollout there was a few house sales. We hit the trigger on apprentices because now we can pay them. Right. Well, and, and we can still do that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still looking at land. I'm not, I know that the lot that I found didn't work out. Um, I never understood how you found out that information. My agent. He just. I got an agent. Okay, you got an agent and he just said. No, due diligence, yeah. A bunch of due diligence contacting the city and, and records and a bunch of emails back and forth. Okay. Realtor. I was just curious about for my own learning when I look at another lot, like, could I have saved us? Well, there's no shortcut to just making all, all calls or uh, look at the websites, uh, email the building department and all that, just a bunch of stuff back and forth. I mean, it was I Brad. Brad was the guy that did it. He, he, he came here. He, he came for Summer X for a week here. He was doing that, actually. Brad? That's my agent. It's my secret agent. Yeah, Brad. Yeah, one one guy, Brad, who came for a week of summer X here. He he actually has some experience in that because his mom is a real estate attorney. Cool. Is he still yeah. there? No, he's he's in California. Okay, so I'm still in conversations about acquiring land around the river and all this stuff. You know, it just takes yeah. time. So, yeah, as far as our timing, I mean, we're, you know, as soon as we finish this house and all that, like, yeah, snapping up a lot is still, still a high priority here. That's, that needs to happen because we prove it by showing that we can build and sell a house, <clears throat> whether it's a client or no client. But according to Steve, he's saying to me, you have to be able to do it where it's spec, where you take all the risk. And then show that model and that model if you can show that then everything else works because you know you've got a product that the market will accept so whether not, then we get into other forms like whether we have clients up front for custom homes or other build projects or city being the client that all falls out right. from the capacity i just think about the whole kit thing and that thing yeah like, I don't know if you, I think you need, you probably need to do that as we met, we talked yeah. about a bunch of times, like you got to have a house in one place in one city to give people the comfort that it's, you know, that it's all legit. And, but beyond oh, yeah, that, yeah. like I would just sell, I would just get a fancy website and start selling kits and let them deal with all that. So kits are another product line. This is, goes into product strategy, but to develop a kit versus a build product, I mean, yeah, different branches of the, uh, of the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, very explicit efforts. You need a team for one, team for the, the other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you see that as your, like you, you have your education model? Do you see that as like the other arm? Well, actually, so to integrate all of them as an ecology is the ultimate goal. Cause imagine getting the apprentices, they're building re real houses. You're also including the crash course in it for people from the outside, just regular people off the street, uh, just trying to mix the education and production in as many ways as possible. The three segments that we already tapped, one is the, the extreme manufacturing crash courses. Two would be now 
education, three would be a real client. Those three, like if you can nail that, that's what we like to do. That's an integrated approach. So imagine like now you're going to school, you're building real stuff in school. That's how you fund the school. Right? I think that it, I think it's like a, one of those circle diagrams, like they're, they all, they need to all have their own lives outside of like where they all mat stack up together because yeah. you have to think about the educational experience, the customer yes. experience. And, you know, like you, it, you could easily like piss a lot of people off, you know, your client. Yeah. Your we student. do that all the time, but yes, you would have to, you would have to have well-developed i like the way you put it actually it's like yeah if you have the well-developed this this aspect that aspect that aspect then you're able to mash them up very effectively oh then it's then everyone's having a blast if they're getting their needs met yeah um anyways uh i'm still pumped about this and um I think that, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't feel confident building a factory until we are, we're, we're getting a certain amount of sales through in kits through an online yeah. site. So I'm really, I really want to see that happen because it improves everything. Um, your positioning, because then you can start saying that a hundred percent of people who go through my program are being paid, what is it, you know, this this wage if they want it. Yeah, yeah, of course. But then you kind of pulled out a chicken and egg argument here because how do you, how you get your kit without the micro factory? Because you can't get that kind of efficiency without having an efficient efficient operation. You can't well, see you, wool. You can <laughs> so still sell things online like, we, we, we could be servicing on your, on your farm. We could be servicing a online site pretty, I, I, we could be breaking at the seams and it could be completely obvious that we are backlogged and back ordered. And that's where I would want to be when I'm talking to someone about buying some, you know, one of these major industrial leasing it out. I mean, we, we would be hedging but de-risked you know it'd be it'd be a lot that'd be a lot easier to make that jump from that moment than to where from where we are right now no of course but that's so that's where i want you to get that. yeah of course of course but i think the branding the sexiness of the solar punk and the kits it's got to have a certain aesthetic and you gotta we have to have all the product benefits and the um so that's why I think we need 200K, you know, or, you know, because it needs like a, we could just hire a firm and they could do all that for us. And we would, we could have, um, hire a, a leader of that particular group and, um, that you trust. The other element that we didn't mention is the media. Um, so eventually getting, you know, all these modules recorded, instructional, and then, so in VR, um, a, a campus and training and um, kind of like a Khan Academy. So imagine like, oh, well, the boy who harnessed wind what would have happened if he would have had access to this amount of information? I mean, he, he could have built himself a house too. He could build himself a, a battery. I don't know. Um, so, I'm talking way too much. But 
You're the anti Amazon. <laughs> this is everybody in their mom is kissing the ring of Amazon for them to come to your, their city. And if we embrace the open source manufacturing model, every single city could produce the most important machines for them to become a resilient society. This is being recorded. That's some good copy. <clears throat> yeah. That is good copy. Uh, like, think about <clears throat> if every single major anchor institution in Kansas City started procuring all the property plan equipment using open source manufacturing products. They, that's, that's what I wrote in that one pager. Do you remember yeah. what I wrote? It says, it transforms the balance sheet of any industrial company because you have lifetime use. Um, so it's, not, it's cheaper to buy, it's cheaper to service, and it lasts longer. So, mm -hmm. um, well, that's happened in 2008 and after. But the thing is, is like, way. <laughs> you've built the education side of the business, but we have to build the product side. That's all. And, um, no, I didn't build either. Now you built the education. You have people, yeah. you, you have, you, you built an education model. I feel like that's the strongest thing. I think. From a product side, I think it's hard for people to buy things from you. It should be extremely easy, <laughs> like one click or something. Um, but it's just, it's that that website was not designed to sell things. It was designed to educate the world about your your um, your expertise. Anyways, I'm gonna get media funding. Um, you know, if you wanted to, you could do a reality show that could be a, another fast track. I could totally see. I don't know about that. Huh? Could be, but it could be a major distraction. It could, could be, be or it could be and it could make you probably make you look like a villain, making people work real hard and they're going to turn you into like March in the dictator or something to try and create you a drama. Huh? Yeah, I mean, we get those kinds of offers all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. From like Vice? A documentary. Um, For reality shows, yeah, we had several came across the desk, but it's like, nah, man, I don't think that's a good strategy right now. Yeah, hmm. I agree. They, they did a reality show of a similar, a guy who was building a village through his students in Panama on Vice. Really? I don't know if you saw that jungle. It was called like, um, anyways, they made the leader look really bad. And I wouldn't want that to happen to you because they wanted to create drama and the students were feeling overworked and that they were paying and it wasn't what they promised. It's and, Town. Oh, is that interesting. The and that's a Panamanian jungle. Now, American entrepreneur and hundreds of young people are building the world's most sustainable modern town. Yeah. Was that so? Was that had any substance, or was it all, all show? I mean, he's not a marchin, uh, but he, you know, he he had good intentions. Probably, I think the infrastructure on. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it, I, what I want to focus in, focus on is getting a budget so that we could film the next extreme design and having hmm. those media assets where we could publish online like Khan Academy. All right. What's happening April 1? What? It's happening April 1. Oh, really? It's on a critical path. The John drew up. Oh, the two week one for the house? Yeah. Okay. I think that's a good goal. It's a little preview for the audiences. Mm -hmm. There's your uh, there's your announcement. Your teaser. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Check. Check that off the task list. I keep forgetting these are recorded. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. Um. <laughs> Well, I've sort of beat the dead horse with the same comments over and over again. But I mean, I'm putting this into every grant pub application I'm working on. So it's only a matter of time. Brian, what, what is your job title? What, what, what do you do? I'm, I'm the director of a found a foundation called the Foundation for Regeneration, which okay. is a 501c3 uh, fiscally sponsored organization of the Giving Back Fund, um, which is like, they're like our back office and our support. And, but we're focused here in Kansas City on the intersection of economic development, social equity and ecological health. And so we have two main projects. Um, one is the Blue River Valley which is this, it's sort of the microcosm of all the world's issues of the economic boom and bust. You know, you had, I talked about it a little bit earlier, but, you know, we have a grant around that with the EDC and the IDA. And I think that there's a, a huge amount of opportunity to apply financial innovation. Well, the way we, we structured our last grant, and I can explain this just because it'd be cool for Marchin and you to know about it, is that the first bucket is what we call the upgrade. The upgrade is about brownfield remediation. You know, we should know the state of every single brownfield in this area and like how bad is it, what is on it, and what are all the techniques in the world in order to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing is things like stage two companies. Stage two companies are anywhere between 10 and 100 million in revenue. Um, and they represent like 15% of all companies, but all, about half of all new jobs. An example of this is like custom truck in the Blue River Valley. You know, they're making basically like diesel trucks and things like that. They already know what their business is. And so there's this concept called economic gardening, basically to expand and sell their products outside of our, it's basically selling innovation, exporting your innovation to other markets. Mm -hmm. And so it grows our pie rather than um, otherwise. Um, basically for every dollar that you invest in a stage two company, it comes back $9 to the economy. Wow. Um, I'm really sorry, guys. Do you mind if I check on my daughter real quick? No. A, yeah, I'll be right back. You said daughter? Daughter. Mm -hmm. What are you looking at, Marchin? Uh, I was looking at economic gardening. Economicgardening.org. Yeah, so he signed a letter of support. The National Center for Economic Gardening has worked in like nine states. I think that from a grant perspective, what we have going for you is rural. Um, and manufacturing. There's more money available than there ever has been in terms of like, there's a once in a generation opportunity through ARPA and all the infrastructure dollars. So we're, I want to have these applications in and I don't know. I think there's probably about people a that actually, there's all this stuff that we're talking about. But what about just actually people who are developing, like here's the assets for the documentation, the design, economic models, like regarding the core development of the Sidika home park, which is what we try to do in the apprenticeship and, part of summer x um any ideas on where that actually comes from like how to and john we actually talked about that like projects students or whatever but it would, it would have to be more seasoned 
more seasoned professionals that actually help in that project, getting a collection of people to say, okay, we're getting around uh, solving housing. Uh, partnerships around that. Oh, um, so is, I thought you were going with this as around financing for students, but what are you asking for now? Yeah. Well, financing for students is one thread. The other thread is um, product. You're talking about product, but yes, going directly to the product, there's on one side you're talking about marketing, but the product the development part, that's the thing that is very hard to get people to show up for. And say John's showing up to, we're actually developing the product of the, the builder cr crash course. Uh, so I guess the relevant question would be, how do we find more people like John, that nature? People who are actually contributing to the product, like the MVP and, and the commercial aspects right. that fall out. I, um, I mean, it's a good question. Because that's really what we're still trying to solve. And Steve said, hey, build that house you you show the the economic model then then you've solved it and you'll be able to pay for talent or attract it um we will sneak that in through the back door like by economic means there here's the economics here's greed or self-interest greed or, or just the fact that you can make a living or financial independence and that through that we can slip in all the other open source ecology aspects once again, smuggle them in because pimping ain't easy. I, my, my take is I just, we've got to hire that kind of talent. Um, you either need to find an entrepreneur who's willing to lean in and you give them, I mean, you know, you hired the talent down earlier. Why not? Yeah. I mean, possibly, possibly, but note, note this, if we hire them talent, that talent, I believe we have failed at that, which we're trying to prove. And that is the collaboration part, the economic collaboration in the open. So it's like the world is at the, this unique place where that just does not take place along the notions of open source ecology. It's not there yet. You know, so, so yeah, we can, you know, we get, we can get the product. We can possibly hire. But man, the only drawback of that is, in my view, we failed to show that which we're trying to, to prove, which is economic collaboration. Well, I mean, economic collaboration. are you a purist or do you want to get things done? <laughs> it really comes down to that. I mean, <laughs> it does. I mean, like, if you're a purist and you want everything to be kind of recreated at every moment then you're sort of it's like quickstand and we can't get anything done i'm, I'm yeah, not recreated collaborated no there's a distinction there okay, reinventing so, okay. Really. Let, let's say that there's talented people listening what is it that you're really offering to them because outside of i pay you you pay me or I pay you, you deliver this service and a scope of work and it's really clear, you know, you have to get really clear on, you're basically asking people to volunteer their time or take equity in something or, it's kind of confusing on that side. You have to be really it's clear. Confusing. It's confusing, it's really a call for investing, investing their time into solving pressing world issues. Now, that's a very vague thing. It's very hard to explain. So, no, that's too that's too too visionary, too too much into this exploratory territory. We need that's the challenge. But I think there still is a solution to that challenge. But I don't know what it is. I mean, I guess what you're saying is that if if you're, what you're describing is like Wikipedia doesn't pay people to manage their, build their website or, and so you want that to happen as, as a result of the, the culture? 
similarly? Well, Wikipedia is not a good model because they do pay their staff $30 million. I think that that's a great thing. I think that, I mean, we should really huddle on this with a whiteboard and come to some like sandboxes and buckets of like, it's hard to build an organization if you want to end job everybody, including any potential employee that you are talking to. I think that it's, it's totally hard. okay. I think it, there's, there's plenty of people that don't want to be an entrepreneur and they just want to do, they want to do the innovative stuff and they want to work with you. And I think it's totally fine if you have a staff of a hundred people working to advance open source manufacturing in every city in the world. I mean, you need that level of. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's fine. The question is, how do we get there? It's that well, it's the, yeah. And I would keep in mind that you're going to change the environment, each progressive step that you take, step that you take. So right, right now you're trying to grapple with like, how are you going to, how are you going to bring all of these people into your world? given their current impressions but as you prototype and mvp and yeah. have, and, oh, and yeah. get more exposure the trade-off between nine to five job that is paying me and investment in oh, open yeah. source manufacturing is going to equalize because it's going to become more feasible more real to them oh yeah Oh, yeah. Like the, the, initial, the initial step is getting is sort of you may have to play in there in the world in which people are comfortable in now to a certain extent, and yeah. it, it, inception happens subtly, you know, in other words, potentially. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know, but we will do all this. <laughs> it's happening sooner rather than later I, I I'm really interested in if if you when you go through that financing workbook I'm sure that there's some things in there that you can implement right now yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about that. I'll take a look. I at have it. been working on finding a, the right kind of finance partner. I haven't found that person or group yet, but if we couldn't find And we're going to have to solve that for the housing part, for the actual housing purchase. Well, like yeah. that for is their own financier. Yeah, if, if we had somebody that was willing to underwrite the loans as like our partner that any for any of the potential clients they were like our preferred financer then it becomes easier you know so uh, that will be that will have to be part of solving this thing yeah, yeah. no i i was doing that for myself my own loan thinking and trying to find the right group that could go you know if they can do one and they have understood your model, then they could do 10 or 100. But yeah. I, I, uh, I actually got denied for my loan. <laughs> so you got that, denied? I, yeah, I got denied. Uh, What'd you tell them? I, I sent them all my information. And I'm, I'm a little bit weird on paper, you know? I'm not like, I'm not, I come off like I have all the money in the world, but I don't. Um, But Ethereum is way up right now. Yeah. I went long on Ethereum. Um, so related to financial innovation, um, the income share agreement is interesting. You know, and you can... 
I think the best way is to find. So one thing I don't understand is what's your feeling about like investment? Like, let's say that we pitch this to somebody <laughs> and they say to, next week we'll put in 200 K to build the product thing out. What can you offer them really? Like how do your values translate from like a equity ownership perspective? Ideally, it would be an offer to, to you can run this business because we're developing a, a distributive enterprise. But that's a very hard sell because that means you actually have to do the work. And investors don't want to do any work. <laughs> but that would be the, in the next economy, that's, that's the thing. You have access. When you equalize the playing field, then you have the access to doing things. Not so by legacy, would... but by, by, by your, your initiative. Now, wasn't that the American dream? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if we can answer some of those questions, even if it is like a DAO and it's, you know, you're really unique, as long, if we could have the answers and we could have our pathways. For yeah. Can play. Um, I got to think about the DAO route. Uh, basically a contract like self-enforcing ways um that there are incentives that are monetizable in some way it's uh, i think there's something there because because the DAO is like it's a structure where here's um, a product you don't have you know what that is uh, you buy a share of it nope mm -hmm. i was just about to ask but i thought march was going to explain it it's a decentralized no, anonymous organization okay so it happens a lot on or lately on these crypto uh, with with Ethereum, people use it for community tokens or like even access through NFTs. Like let's say that everyone had a OSC token. Well, if you had an OSC token, you could that could be the only thing that you need in order to get on the wiki. Okay. Saying that he wants it open source, maybe you don't do that. That would be technically a paywall. So you probably wouldn't do that, Martin, would you? No, you could you could do an NFT like that. Why not? <clears throat> well, because then it's not open source; it's pay to play. Yeah, but you can pay in different ways. What about paying by learning skills so you can contribute back? That would be the right way to pay to play. Or maybe would you be open to like a certain amount of knowledge that's. I mean, you kind of already do that, but like there's like layers of free and then there's like a premium. Yeah, I mean, that's doable. Like you can, which is what exists already. It's like everything is out there, but good luck finding it, right? Yeah. So the value added is that you make it easy. Yeah. While not eliminating true open access because somebody who wants to spend the time, they can actually find all that info. It's all there. Only yeah. that that number of people that have the time or initiative or, or fire in their pants to do it is very small. People want processed product. Yeah, you could charge for that. Did I show you all my, my idea for membership? No. Uh, this is the only part on our website where it talks about it. But something like this. Oh, let's see. So it's like you're a member and then you get access to, you know, more membership and you get a, a pair of goggles. Mm. You get access to our virtual reality campus yeah. mm. in person retreat. Um, I mean, that kind of model then you just really have a program manager and customer experience and start sharing.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing about this, John, the interesting thing about this is that I've spent most of my career learning things that universities can't really teach. They're not innovative enough, unfortunately. Mm. I mean, they're just now teaching social entrepreneurship. I mean, I started in social entrepreneurship 10 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. so, well, it's very, uh, it's very salient to me having just finished grad school. Right. When are they going to teach open source manufacturing? I mean, it could 2008. be 2008. Yeah. When we're done and right. I can retire <laughs> for the next time. When we've uploaded your consciousness into the, <laughs> the computer, into an AI. Yeah. That we well, just, well, just FYI, I mean, have you heard the date 2008? The day? Date. Uh, have you heard me talk about 2008? No. No, well, 2008 is uh, a 10 year mark from 1998 when, when I, no, 19, 2008, when I said to myself, uh, whatever we've got at that time in terms of open source know-how, that's it. We got to move on to applications and the next step because I ain't doing this stuff forever. Uh, I got to move on. Window of opportunity. So we're going to ideally open source uh, the technosphere by 2008. If, if we don't get there, uh, that's all we got and we got to move on. But applications like entrepreneurship, the OSC campuses, basically a teaching kind of facility. I don't understand because it's 2021. I'm doing the same math. Uh, yeah. 2018 was a 10 year mark where I said, oh, I got, I'm quitting in 10 years, man. I'm done with this. So, <laughs> so I said by 2028, whatever we've got at that time in terms of, yeah, 2028. And, oh, sorry. What did I say? 2008? Yeah. You said 2008. Um, it's getting late. It's like a financial crisis. My, I was like, Whoa. my uh, my brain's going dead. Twenty twenty eight is when uh, OSC transitioned to actual applications. So away from okay, what we develop for open collaborative development of technology to open source the technosphere and the economy. Uh, that's what we got. We got to move on to applications. That's that's kind of the timeline at this point. What does that mean? I'm going to move on to applications. Replicating OSC campuses largely. Okay. Entrepreneurial development. The idea is still like about the multiple points of light in these campuses that we train people for. So like if there's a, right now I believe it's a four year minimum um, for somebody to learn the way of open source ecology. How do you collaboratively design? How do you design and build anything? How do you collaborate? How do you solve? start solving pressing world issues. Four year program, that's what we need at this point. So the timeline is like, wow, we could actually have some people that actually know that pattern by 2008. Um, but whatever happens- 2028. Gotta move on, 2028, sorry. Uh, gotta move on. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's seven years from now. Seven years, man, we got seven years. Holy cow, we got to do it. Mm. Well, that's why the recordings will be really helpful. <laughs> why the reporting? What? Recording? Recording. recording. Yeah. Like I, I'm going to, I want to hire a team to record the actual instructionals yeah. and edit it together where it's like, you could, well, think Khan Academy. Have you been on Khan Academy? Yeah. Great stuff. I was actually thinking about reaching out to them. Like maybe they've gotten so successful, maybe they have some funds. Yeah, I mean, they, some of their stuff verges close on kind of stuff we do, like applied teaching. Uh, they're quite applied. They're not applied as we are in the same sense of building things. But yeah, they're, they've got a lot of substance substance there. That's the background, a lot of background knowledge. Well, gentlemen, um, 
we jumped around a lot. We had some fun. We talked about a lot of things. Um, let me know how I can be helpful. I think that if if we did a little work session, March, and we could come up with some financial options for your current students. Like the income share agreement, or um, if we could do one of these like peer to peer platforms, you could, you know, see what G General Assembly is doing. I think that's worth yeah. investing in. Definitely. Can you start a, a page on your wiki? On, sure. on your log? Sure. Start throwing stuff in there. All right. Are you waiting for me to hop off? No, I think we're going to have to all sign off. Any final words, John? No, I'm just excited to be here. It's 9.30 p.m. So you're feeling okay. better, Marchin? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's all clear. But yeah, wrapping up Winter X and full time on the house. Back in the trenches. Am I the worst yeah. student? I am. Did I fail? No. I mean, I came a couple times. I just. Um... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're working on other areas of endeavor. So. Are you? Yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. well, um, let's see what we can drum up with the, I mean, it's good to know that, not to put all the eggs in the GI basket, but it's good to know kind of what they do and the context of them as a financial, yeah. I mean, it was interesting, even in the General Assembly, it's in their financing handbook is where you find it. Right. So like the, the bigger category yeah, yeah. is financing for students, right? Right. Um, I will write some people and it's helpful to have a call to kind of get us <laughs> thinking about it. And, you know, maybe, maybe we can do another one. Um, we could also get on the phone with our, my grant writer, Sarah, and she'll get excited. I think if she meets you. So awesome. we can come down, come down to Maysville. Sweet Maysville, Missouri is waiting for you. <laughs> Rural yeah. economic development. I mean, just from that perspective, if you were to build your factory there, that's, there's, that's a lot of opportunity. Well, that's that's what's happening. I mean, if we haven't touched our community, I don't think we have legitimacy anywhere else. So yeah, it has to start in our backyard. Um, what I don't understand is if I get if I have somebody who's like, this sounds really cool. If I give you 200k, what do I get? We, if we I would can't say, that question, we've got to figure out the answer. I'll give you 200K. What do I get? Um, <laughs> hmm. It's an interesting question. We need to do some, some design around the entities and the governance and think about some things in order to be able to take on. I think that there's, in my small little brain at the moment, without talking about DAOs, which are going to happen later. You have an education nonprofit and a for-profit um, 
kit business. When you say 200K, are you saying a donor or an investor, or is that the same? In that situation, I was thinking about an investor. Because I do feel like if we put in a certain amount of money around branding expertise, website, and then story and aesthetic, you could you could create a, a strong business on the on the kit business. I would add, my mind goes immediately on a question like that is what physical things do you need invest in their production so that you get the product that's the best in the world? Or is money and not an issue to them where they buy whatever shit they get off the shelf and don't care about other properties. But I think we can make an offer saying, hey, get this product and now, oh, if it's some product, whether it's got lifetime design or environmental friendliness or whatever that is, our, our role is to say, we've got something better and invest in it to develop it because the only way you can develop it to be the best is collaboratively through open source. Um, well, and that is a pretty hard sell, but that's kind of how the DAO, that would be like the essence of the DAO, invest in something that doesn't exist, but something that does not kill or steal from anybody, which the current economy does everywhere. So if you want to invest in this deeper level, this is what, what you do. So to a single investor, it might be a little hard, but I think a structure like DAO lends itself to, <clears throat> to crazy ass thinking where you can actually start getting into the white paper that explains the logic and people actually sign into that. It's my two cents. Yeah, maybe. I don't. I don't want to. Don't. I would say. Um. I don't know. I wouldn't say that to an investor. <laughs> I would, I would, I would take. Yeah, because they're at a the different money. level right now. Mm. Right. I would. So. I would put what you just said into research on the nonprofit research. Say, oh, we can do some nonprofit stuff. You can donate it. We can do research on the product of your choice, or we can invest it in something that is going to be our engine of growth, which is going to help sell products like. We need to be able to buy Google AdWords. We need to be able to have a brand, product descriptions, product sites, sell kits. And then that ultimately will pay for all the apprentices when they finish. They'll have plenty of clients. Now they could go out so, on their own. And what you said, how does that benefit the investor though? Are, are they getting financial return? Yeah. I mean, he would how? be... Well, there's only a number of, at the moment, you could, I think that what the way I would do it is just an equity investment. So maybe OSC is an equity holder. Can't do that, but but what about, uh, so do we, do we create a structure that is for sale at the end of the day? That's the difficulty there, because we're not for sale. That's the thing, That's it's, it sounds purist, right? But um at the end of the day it's like to figure out is our yeah that's what i was trying to figure out is where do you where do you stand philosophically or values wise well, on just, okay yeah well for, a few ways to finance your business you can take on debt or you can get an equity investment yeah imagine an equity where where the wealth stays in the company forever and people can trade stock but they can never cash out see what i'm saying so you're retaining the wealth in this organization and, wh and what's the wealth in the organization that means the service it provides so that like the parasitic thing of like oh yeah people just buying and selling shares of it so that'll be the the equity it doesn't matter it doesn't destroy the substance of the organization. See, because once people start hoping to sell, like, because there's going to be 
like a cash out at the end of the day, that, that will shift the dynamic to what happens inside the organization. So this, this kind of stuff that I haven't really seen what I'm describing. Yeah. And I'm, Maybe I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not so convinced that all equity investments are parasitic. I think that there's plenty of equity partners that are really value add and, but they do want to exit at some point and they could exit to you or an existing stakeholder or to a whole community. They don't have to exit to a big company and you can have constraints on those exits. So yeah, you'd have to define an exit so that, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I think maybe, maybe just hacking the existing, existing structures might work. Yeah, I, I don't have any problem with someone saying, I think what you're doing is valuable. And so I'm gonna give you 200K right now where no one else is giving us 200K. And then we take that and build the the best. I mean, we take that 100, 200K and turn it to 200 million with the right media strategy, the right kits, the right brand, the right photos. <clears throat> and they should be rewarded for taking that level of risk with us. But yeah, you don't, it can't influence the culture. It, but, I, you know, like I said, I, I can play with a lot of different sort of models of thought and I'd say philosophy, depending on, I was just like, I don't really know where you stand on these things. And what I, what I think that you need is to, I think that if we could set that up, get it going, kids going, hire a CEO and just, that's like your sister brother organization where they're selling, they're building the factory and doing all this stuff. You're providing the workforce and educating and, and doing like R and D and you have a nonprofit that could own part of that company, the majority of that company. Anyways, it's getting late. John sitting there with his kid in the other room all nice <laughs> I, I mean well i was gonna say if you can sell beating the market so it's just turn the 200k into a form of debt with the blue you know a balloon payment after the first product delivery or whatever that it's 10 percent or instead of eight percent you know they still get a guarantee they get a return it's capped out and they don't own a piece of the company either but I may be complicating things here because it is getting late. Yeah. We got to figure out, we got to iron out where you stand on a lot of this stuff, Martin, so that we know what instruments. Ultimately, it's all about, you know, navigating and what instruments you are willing to take on. They're all just financial instruments that will help you yeah it will be determining the governance that goes into those instruments that that could be done like if it could be done and executed and enforced yeah it can use various various ones depends what the the rules are yeah, yeah. i think we can write rules for uh some of these things yeah and the I mean, but it has to be related to ethical uh, distributive economies. I mean, I mean, yeah, I don't think anybody would stuff. be interested in what you're doing if they weren't into that. Why not? If you're going to make money, it wouldn't have to be ethical. Oh, yeah, I'm they, they wouldn't. OK, if there's a return like that, they're not going to say, oh, they're ethical there's no, they, plenty of it. there's plenty of impact investors out there but what's interesting is that it almost feels like we don't have the right people you know we need somebody who's built like a you know 
who's ran a factory and with an e-commerce component. I mean, that kind of profile. Oh, yeah, of course we don't have those people. Yeah, we might. What? Yeah, we, of course we don't have those people. So. Yet. Yet. I think that, I think that was Katarina's idea originally, the kits. I think the DIY kit world, it's that could be a serious company there. Of course, of course. Product strategy kits on one side, there's builds, turnkey builds. Those, those could be significant both could be significant. I, I would think that the actual real builds for people would be the bigger because nobody's going to build their own kit. There's just a much smaller market for that. The, that, is a, that is the truth. The market for the kits is much smaller compared to the market for turnkey builds. Just because I mean, yeah. you've seen it. Who's, who's, building, who's building their own house? I mean Unless you're providing a service to, for the kid buyer to actually have somebody else build that as well. That's, that's when the kits could. I guess uh, I'm the majority, like a big market, huge, huge market. Yeah. Cause nobody builds their own house. No mo. Well, there's a, there's tiny home movement. People are doing their bands and, and their RVs and their buses conversions and um, let's talk about that. The three D printers. Yeah. Um, it almost feels like you know you used to build your model rockets and you know it's kind of like you know what if every science class in the country built a three D printer fifth grade you know. Of course, of course. That's possible, right? Yeah. Like, I think there is a market for DIY craft making, essentially. Like, I mean, like, there's a there's a market, but yeah, I don't think that market solves housing. It would be part of the solution. Right, it's different than solving housing. That's a whole different. That's a different. Um, that's where we start. That's what that's you want. That's the goal. That's a, that's a starting premise. We solve housing, we invite people because we're calling out for solving housing. That's how we get the bigger people to show up. That's the, the theory people. of open source collaboration. <clears throat> yeah, the people who really wanna do that or people who who have a great track record in it. Um, I think that's where I, where I get a little bit different than you because I see like all the things that you've done and all the different products I'm thinking like, um, what really sells it for me is making a city, giving this city its own capacity for resiliency. So like the way I pitch it is like the 50 most important machines for a, a civilization to become resilient. Um, so for me, it's very much like all the different little things that it's like a like you said the starter kit or the reboot or like if there's a disaster you're that one person and you're playing into all the different things i mean it's like the perfect brand you're playing into all the people that are buying bunkers and um solving housing that's like it's a completely different premise but i know that you're you're really into that yeah, it is a different premise, but it's also an outcome of if you have the enabling technologies, but not just enabling technologies, the paradigm for how you collaborate to develop things in general, because that's the actual product of the GVCS. It's not the 50 tools. It's the techniques to develop anything collaboratively. That's really the, 
like the 50 things are tangible things. The bigger product that's underneath that is a way for people to collaborate, to shift culture towards that. Out of which the natural byproduct is things like, oh, let's solve housing. Let's solve energy. Is it because the swarm builds or what is it? Is well, it no, it's collaboration. It's collaboration. And there's various techniques we develop. Swarm builds is one technique we've developed, but it's really collaborative design. It's the collaborative part, collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. That's our mission. So the collaboration is what's going to solve the problems because problems are bigger, bigger than individuals and together we can accomplish more. So the, the, the premise here is, is really about collaborating. That's, that's what we're trying to sell. Is there something that I could watch that talks about your, your, the collaboration? Because when I think about it, I, I get like swarm builds, but I haven't, and maybe- Oh, uh, there's a page, a wiki page on our wiki called Collaborative Literacy. There's a few few discussions on that. And today with Jana, we were talking about that nah, nobody buys it, it's cool. Uh, but to implement, to, to really learn it is hard. That's my conclusion from this year. So part of what, so John, before we talked to you, we were talking about, well, maybe we need to take that discussion to a higher level. Just, just get that, get the premises in there more understandable by a larger majority of people. Because right now we focus a lot on actual technical tool, tools to get there, the actual how you do it. Here's how you collaborate openly. Bam, it's too hard. It's, it's a lot of elements in there. It includes cult, culture and technology mindset. Yeah. Uh, but collaborative literacy captures the bigger, I think the bigger concept. Okay. Um, well, I, it's interesting. We gotta, to communicate this effectively would be good. Like, uh, so we really get people inspired. Because I think, like, I'm still convinced that, and I can't sell this to anybody yet, but <laughs> I'm convinced that this collaborative thingy, man, it is the most powerful thing, but it's well, very well misunderstood and, and nobody really does it. And the problem is people think they do it. So there's this big elephant in the room, this big meta story we're living in regarding collaboration and collaborative literacy. And to explain it well, that would be a treat. Maybe people would actually understand what we do and how we do it uh yeah i mean i i've been hanging around and maybe i don't even understand it sounds like there's a lot of elements to it I mean, the ecology part in there and the name of the org is the integration of societal natural uh, ecosystems that work together in harmony. All right, well, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, but I'm retiring in 2028. And then what? <laughs> party, man, just party. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to retire. No, of course not. We're going to build a thousand OSC campuses, global villages worldwide, centers of regenerative beauty, like you're describing in your 100 million proposal. He's going to move to that jungle village in Panama. <laughs> um, yeah. All don't, right. All right. Don't do a documentary on vice. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's the message for today. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Um, I think we got some follow-ups. Um, are you on, uh, John, are you on the um, Discord for OSE? No? Marchin, are you on there? Yeah. Because I don't see you. I have to find you on there. Do you check it or are you mostly on email? <laughs> no. no, I haven't checked them. Just maybe here and there once in a while. We got to shame mm. you for that. Yeah, a public shaming would do. Super user. You should be the super user. All right. Well. Okay. Yeah. 
well invite jonathan if you do use that but yeah um if you don't use it then we'll just stick to email yeah yeah i prefer right. slack i actually i could i invited you to my slack for my foundation but you don't use slack i'm guessing not so much And then you're talking about collaborative literacy. <laughs> Go figure that. Communication platform acceptance. Yeah. <laughs> Caught red-handed. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one of the literacy components? Platforms? It's got to be. All right. Well, I think. Okay, guys. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Thanks. We'll see you guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, John. Thank you. You too. John, send me the recording. I'll do. Blast it all over the world. Yeah. Okay. All right. Later, man. Bye.